Welcome everybody, my name is Captain Jay. I'm glad to be talking with you today about oysters. And this is kind of our oyster preview. So looking at oysters, some of the things associated with oysters are reefs, recreation, restoration, ecology, economy, and history. And all these things kind of come together around our oysters. How many of you guys have eaten oysters before? And y'all ever cut your hand or cut your foot on an oyster reef before? All you've done that before at the beach, right? Okay, so oysters, again, you've definitely got a relationship with them, whether you like it or not there. Maybe some of you, have, you've eaten oysters before? No? You have your try? <laughs> it's an acquired taste. Let's see, some people love them or they hate them. You know, I enjoy them myself here, but I do like them during the winter months. But uh, oysters, again, are real important to us here. I'm going to advance this on. There we go, the next one there. All right, let's talk a little oysters here, first of all. I've got a a bag of oysters here grab you one pick you one out there i'm gonna grab this one here so save that one but go ahead grab grab you one have an oyster get to know your oyster here got it i'll tell you what grab a couple for those folks over there for me if you would oh he got you some good ones there okay get to know your oyster take a look at it all right what do you notice about your oyster How's it feel? Good, Don't cut yourself with your oyster. That's not good. Don't want to do that. Very rigid. It's rigid. It's got some. Do you notice anything about there's a white side and a kind of a dark side on it there? Okay. Do me a favor here. As you're looking at your oyster, getting to know it, anybody name your oyster yet? Uh, Frank. <laughs> Frank. That's good. Frank the oyster. Do me a favor. Make me a sketch of your oyster. Old school biologist. We worked a lot with biological illustrations. And of course, these days, everybody's got a phone, so you can take pictures of stuff. But still, the old school illustrations are good because you can really highlight some of the details there. Take a minute or two, take a look at it there, get you a sketch. I see a lot of y'all are kind of tracing around it there. That's pretty good. But look at your neighbor's oyster shell as well. How is yours the same? How is yours different from theirs? Okay, see if you can get some of those ridges in there, see what makes it unique. One side should look really different from the other, right? Now notice when we're looking at this, we're looking at the oyster shell. This is not the animal oyster. There's a lot of neat stuff out there. Of course, you can do the, the animal itself dissection there. It involves a, a few sharp implements there, so we're not gonna do that today, but there's a lot of neat stuff you can do and break those open and you can go through and look at the actual parts of the animal. This is the part of the, uh, the animal actually secretes the shell. And what do y'all think that shell's made out of mostly? Anybody wanna take a guess? It's not bone, is it? <laughs> we don't call it bone, we call it shell, right? Any ideas? Calcium. calcium. A lot of calcium in there. Where does it get that calcium from? They take calcium pills, you think? They drink a lot of milk? The water. It's coming out from the water. So a lot of this stuff is actually the animal itself takes that in and then starts laying down layers of this stuff here. All right, everybody's got a pretty decent sketch going of their oyster. You can continue on there. But everybody take a look at your oyster and put your thumb on that little thumbprint that's inside there. Y'all see that? That little muscle scar? What that is, that's one of the things that identifies an oyster, okay? If you're walking along the beach and you see any shell and it's got that dark muscle scar in it, chances are it's going to be an oyster. Oysters have that single muscle scar in there. It almost looks like a little thumbprint, so that identifies it as an oyster there. Oysters have a single muscle that holds it together. Most of our oysters, they always grow longer and narrower. Most of our other bivalves, they grow shorter and wider. They'll actually split that muscle and have two muscles. These guys just have the single one. Have any of y'all ever shucked oysters before? When you go to shuck an oyster, you have to first of all break it back here by the hinge, this area here known as the umbo. You have to break that area there. And then once you break that area, you gotta come back in with your knife and you gotta slice that area off of the shell so that that little animal We'll slurp in there. If you try to slurp it without cutting that, it just kind of hangs in your mouth and doesn't go in. So you've got to cut that little muscle to make sure that it falls in. But that's if you're into shucking oysters, those are the two things you need to know. You've got to be able to cut that, cut that muscle loose and also break that little umbo area. So which area do you think is the oldest part of the shell? Which area do you think is the newest part of the shell? That next one there. What do you think? 
It's going to be that's going to be there from the beginning exactly. So it's going to grow from this end here, and it's going to go out. It's going to lay down layer upon layer. So this area here is going to be the newest part of the shell. That's also the sharpest part of the shell. Those of you guys that go fishing out in the reefs out there, if you walk on an oyster reef, uh, you got to be very careful because that's where all the brand new growing portion of the oyster is. It's almost like a razor out there, so it can be a real, a real sharp. I had a friend of mine here just recently. We were out there. Uh, John Armstrong, a friend of ours, actually was going along, walking along, and he stumbled over, and man fell down, and he was wearing boots, and he had his waders on and everything. The problem is he wasn't wearing gloves, which none of us normally do, but he came down and actually sliced his hand up real bad. We spent the rest of the afternoon at the emergency room there, so you got to be a little careful when you're around oysters there, because they are very, very sharp. Okay, let's see our drawings here. Is everybody doing pretty good with them? All right, I want you all to do me a favor. Put your oysters back in the bucket here. Like I said, you guys all had to get to know your oyster, right? Let's see. All right. If y'all want to, come on up and see if you can find your oyster. You guys all became experts on them there. Come on up, take a look, see if you can find your oyster again now. Is that the one? All right, you got it. Using your biological drawing there, you should be able to identify it easy enough. Got one there? No, I think that's it. That'll work. The, um, but yeah, as you can see, all these oysters are different, but after looking at it there and kind of getting it in, you can actually find your specific oyster there. So they are kind of unique. Now again, look at your neighbors there. Notice how it's similar to it, how it's different. And also if we had a big group, and I've done this with larger groups, well, it's really fun to get over. I've had kid gets in a fight over which oyster was theirs and which one wasn't there. So you want to make sure you pick out your oyster there. But a little bit about it, get to know it there. You can hang on to that for me as we talk about it. But let's get into some biology here of the oyster, okay? These guys obviously didn't start out this size here, right? These guys are all in class bivalvia. Bivalve, like bicycle, it has two wheels. These guys have two halves. Notice I only have one half of the oyster. These guys have a very kind of crude uh, 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 little hinge on them here, so they don't hold together. After they die off, they usually split apart, and we never find a lot of them together. If you find one that's together, that usually it's a live oyster or it's a recent one that's dead. So we usually only find just one half or one valve. I told you already about the little purple thumbprint there. That's one of the ways that muscle actually holds that animal together. Uh, these guys are all filter feeders. And one of the things that these guys do is they basically spend all day sucking water in one side, circulating it around over their gills and organs, and then passing that water through. Anybody want to take a guess at how many gallons a day an oyster filters per day? 100. 100, less than 100. 80. Less than 80. Keep going. 20. Around 50, somebody over here, around 50 gallons of water a day. So that's 50 gallons of water per oyster. How many oysters do you have? There's 50 gallons, 50 gallons, 50 gallons. 50. That's a lot. Now imagine how many oysters we have out in the bay. That's a lot of oysters. So they're filtering quite a bit of water. Well, what are they filtering out of the water? What these guys feed on is they love all the little microscopic algae and all the microscopic diatoms that are in our water. What color is our water out here mostly? We have crystal clear blue water. No, not normally. What color is our water in our bays? Kind of greenish, yeah, greenish brown water, okay? Well, guess what? If you look at that water under a microscope, you're going to see that it's kind of this bunch of microscopic green algae and a bunch of microscopic golden brown diatoms. That's one of the major things that these guys are filtering out. So as that stuff comes through there, it filters that out, allows the animal to grow, and starts to lay down that calcium as well. And next thing you know, we have oysters. Our oysters grow roughly about an inch a year. So take a look at your oyster. Using your estimation skills, how old do you think your oyster is? About three. Three years or so? Three years, three to four years, something like that. Yeah, some of them, I've got some bigger ones over here that may be longer there. But on average, about, I say about an inch a year. So most of these are around that three to four year range, which is good. They have to be at least three inches to be legally harvested here in Texas. So three inches, these are all legally harvested. Anybody have any legal shells? I don't see any. Most of these are good size there. So they have to be that size. Um, take a look at your shell there. Can you tell me if it's male or female? How many of y'all have male oyster shell? How many of y'all have female oyster shells? How many of y'all don't know? Exactly, we don't know. Exactly, good. You have both actually, male and female. These guys typically start off as males, okay, but then they transfer over and they will alternate. 
uh, male and female. And the reason for this is, again, we want to make sure we have lots of fertilization out there. Fertilization is external. So we have groups that are female oysters. They will release eggs. We'll have other oysters that are male. They will release the sperm into the water. And if they happen to meet out there, then they will actually get fertilized and they will begin this life cycle of an oyster. The first time, first couple weeks of an oyster, it's actually free swimming and it'll be swimming around and it's gonna be looking for something solid to attach to. Okay, like boat bottoms, <laughs> boat bottoms, pier pilings, rocks, uh, things like that. But what they really like to attach to are other oysters. Any of y'all have any other oysters attached to their oyster? I know the one I'm holding here has got another little baby oyster here that started on it. It's about a year or so old, okay? But you'll see a lot of oysters attached to other oysters because it's a good, good substrate for them. They will actually kind of glue their head down and that's where they're gonna be the rest of their life. They're what we call a sessile organism. They don't move anymore. Kind of like me on the couch in the afternoons when I get home, I sit on the couch and I become a sessile organism. Okay, these guys are stuck there for their whole life. Imagine if you had to be one place for your whole life, where would it be? I don't know, but an oyster has to choose that early on and that's where they're stuck for the rest of their, their time, okay? Uh, another thing interesting about oysters there, they do have to have a little bit of current coming through the area. So as this current flows through, it's bringing in fresh nutrients for them and it's also taking away their waste material. One problem with oysters, they do produce a lot of waste and if there's not enough current, it will actually foul themselves in their own feces there. So what a horrible way to die. Can you imagine that? So this current's very, very important to them. They want to make sure that they have enough stuff coming in also to carry that waste material out. And a little bit of fresh water is always good for these oysters too. They don't like the real, real salty stuff like we get out in the Gulf. They don't like the really fresh stuff we have in our rivers, but those areas in between in our back bays and our estuaries where they have that mixture of fresh and salt water, that's the type of environment that they really like, okay? Those of y'all that go out fishing out here, if you go out towards Port Aransas, not a lot of oyster reefs. You go back into our back bays, Nueces Bay, Copano Bay, Mission Bay, those areas, really dominated with oyster reefs. So again, you'll see that they're a little more associated with those freshwater outflow areas. Okay, any questions so far? We talk about oysters. Oysters are also very family oriented, if you want to say here. They like to be around other oysters. I was just mentioning about how they like to attach to other oysters. This is actually out going towards Nueces Bay. In fact, some of the oysters y'all have there come right off of this spot right over there when you're driving over to Corpus from Portland. That little area off to the right, if you get a low tide, you'll see them out there. But that's thousands and thousands of oysters right there. Some of them are dead, some of them are living. Uh, but again, they're filtering water 50 gallons a day. Obviously not today. So what do you think an oyster does when it dries out? Does it die instantly? No, it actually is kind of designed for this. What it'll do is actually that muscle will actually hold the shell together there and it'll continue doing its thing. A lot of times you'll actually see oysters squirt. If you see them at a low tide, you'll actually see a little stream of water of that waste being shot out of them there, but they can do this and sometimes up for a week out there, they can hang out as long as they're not underwater. So we do get some low tides, they will be exposed. Other times they may be underwater for days and days and days. It actually makes for a stronger muscle. So uh, one of the things that happens is we do have these things dry out. You'll notice that they're all kind of clumped together there. So when we have one oyster, then we have another oyster come in, then we have another oyster come in. And next thing you know, we've got about a dozen oysters that are all hanging out together there and they're starting to form a reef. And if it's got a good area with fresh water coming in, a little bit of current, plenty of food there, they're not sinking down into the sediment. Next thing you know, over the next 100 to 200 years, we end up forming this neat oyster reef out there. Okay? And these reefs, let me move on here again. These reefs, again, are really important for our environment down here. They provide a lot of ecological benefits. Uh, there's also all kinds of habitat associated with it there. Those of y'all that have fished around oyster reefs out there, you know they bring in a lot of big fish. Well, the big fish are there because they're feeding on the small fish and the smaller fish and the smaller fish, and then they're picking their way through all the little different mud crabs and algae and sponges and shrimp and everything associated with these oyster reefs. Uh, they provide a lot of sediment stabilization. They actually hold that sediment together there so it's not all just being eroded away. Uh, we mentioned already about water filtration, how they're filtering about 50 gallons a day. And there's all kinds of complex food webs associated with oyster reefs out there. I know right now, one of the big things people are catching are a lot of these big black drum. And black drum always are kind of associated with these big oyster reefs out there. They're actually feeding off all the different barnacles and all kinds of other things that are living on that oyster reef. So uh, really important there. You can see my buddy out there fishing. Let's see what we got next here. Okay. 
Uh, one of the things that really fascinates me is I like to look at the history associated with our area here. So our history and ecology are both really linked, and one of the best specimens of this here is looking at our oysters. Oysters are our original Happy Meals, and you guys all in either fourth or seventh grade had Texas history, right? Right, if you were in Texas, you got that, okay? And you probably learned about the Karankawas. Most people learned about the Karankawas, about a sentence, maybe two sentences in a book there, but what do we know about the Karankawas? Spelled with a K, sometimes spelled with a C, and you all know anything about the Karankawas? A couple of things that we do know is that uh, the one thing everybody knows is that they're cannibalistic, and that's scary, and heck, whatever it is, that scares the heck out of us there, but probably were. Uh, the other thing we know about our Kronk was that they were relatively tall, but these were our first true wetland people here. They actually hung out along the Texas Gulf Coast here. None of them left anymore, so we can't ask them. They were all pretty much wiped out after uh, Anglo started coming to the area here, colonization. But these folks here existed a lot off of our oyster shell, and uh, one of the reasons we think that they were possibly tall is they had a very good diet. Oysters. If you take a look at your oyster there again, very high in protein, got all kinds of carbohydrates and fat in there, and they were easy to hunt. Most of our Plains Indians spent time chasing after buffalo, spearing a buffalo, then eating a buffalo, and then having to do it all over again. It took a lot of energy. If you're going to collect oysters or seafood, how hard is it? You hungry? Yeah, let's go get some oysters. All you got to do is wait out in the water, bend over, and pick them up. I've got some cool artifacts here to pass around if you want to take a look at. These are actually some Karankawa fishing weights. And so they were using our oysters. They obviously didn't have Walmart to go to. But these uh, are actual, somebody took the time to actually carve those little holes in there. I found a bunch of these on the backside of Matagorda Island years ago. And man, I was all excited. I thought it was some kind of a jewelry or decoration. And one of my historical friends told me, so no, they were probably fishing weights. So there we go. Yeah, so what you're looking at here are probably some old fishing weights associated with our Karankawas here. It's a really fascinating people here. And a little bit more about our Karankawa here. I'd like to say this is an actual picture of Karankawa. This is an artist rendition of it here. But a couple of things about the oysters. They were very high in protein. So again, they were a, a good meal. These guys were eating for, to survive. They weren't like looking like we are, whether it tasted good or not. So it was more about protein and what they were getting out of it there. But high in protein, very easy to obtain. So one of the things that they were able to go through is, of course, these oyster reefs all you had to do was wait out there pick them up didn't require a lot of energy there you may cut your feet up a little bit but very easy to do you weren't like you were having to chase after herds of buffalo that kind of stuff lots of them out there and they didn't have to be eaten immediately so again I was talking about them being the original happy meal uh, these guys you can actually take them back hang out on shore with them for a while we still find today what are called middens and these middens are basically little Karankawa trash piles uh, where these guys would come up and grab these oysters and then they would basically have a little party there they put them on the pit or whatever whatever it is and eat them and then the oysters would stack up and time after time over a while eventually you get these large piles of oyster shells. So there's quite a few of those around the Rockport area and through Ingleside here. Uh, I'm not aware of much over in Corpus at the moment but most of our stuff here is now actually out into the bay due to the erosion. Uh, so a little bit about our oyster shell there and some of our historical stuff there associated with them. The um, uh, one other thing before we get into our oyster shell, I do have a few other items here. This is actually some Karankawa pottery that actually comes from Ingleside, y'all's backyard here. Um, if you take a look at it here, you can take a look and uh, pass those around if you want. You can feel them. You can even feel some thumbprints in there where somebody actually made the pottery there. And again, it's not necessarily oyster related, but you'll notice there's some black substance on the back sides of some of these. That's actually asphaltum. That's natural asphalt or natural tar that comes up on the beach there. And so they would use that to waterproof their pots there. So if you want to take a look at those, you can pass those around. That actually comes from over, uh, you know, where the, what's that called out there? The green, green turtle or the green turtle inn out there off of Ingleside in the bay there. Back behind that, there's some dunes. What, brass turtle, that's it. Thank you, thank you. Now back behind that, there's some dunes back there. And before it was all, uh, taken over by the port. You used to be able to hike back through there and on the top of those dunes you can dig around and you'll find a lot of these little pieces of pottery back there. Pretty cool. All right. As you guys are looking at that stuff there, let's get into some harvesting methods of oysters out there. We've got a couple of different types here. We have cooning, uh, named after raccoons. We'll talk about that here in a little bit. Some tongs. And we can also use the dredge. But you guys have all seen in our area here uh, going along and picking up oysters here. Old school way to do it was what we call cooning. This is where what our Karankawas did. You walk along out there and you scurry along like a raccoon and you start picking up oysters and you bend over. You decide whether you have enough energy to stand up and shuck them or if you want to just do it right there on the ground. This is an old picture from back uh, over off San Antonio Bay and they used to actually do hunting 
trips out of there, they drop you off on an oyster reef with a shotgun and an oyster knife. And so you got to go hunting for the morning. And then when you got hungry, you had the oyster knife and you had your lunch there. So again, that's not only ancient man that was using this for food. We're still using it today here, but cooning for oysters there. The, uh, another technique that we're doing now is the actual dredge material here where they use these oyster dredging here. Uh, but if you look at the dredge here, you'll see this device off on the side. I got a few more pictures of it here. It's a pretty efficient way to do it now because these guys come along and as you can see, pretty effective with picking up oysters there. These guys are always looking for oysters that are about three inches or longer if they're less than three inches they're supposed to throw them back onto the reef and more than three inches they can harvest them they also have to be separated out so for example if you had an oyster like this here that would be an illegal oyster you could not harvest this one here you'd have to take that and toss that back onto the reef but if you had your little hammer handy and you can chip it off to where you're just down to one little oyster sure enough you can put that in your bag so they want to make sure they get these down to individual oysters but as these guys go along they drag this around they're going to come along and they'll start bagging them up. If you notice, they use these coffee bags and that's not for, well, they're actually recycled coffee bags here. A lot of them come from out of the Houston area there and they'll bag them up. These bags weigh about 80 to 100 pounds. So you're a pretty good sized dude, right? Can you pick up 80, 100 pound bag? No problem, right? How many of those could you do in a day, you think? Two, yeah, exactly. These guys, I'll show you the guy who's loading the bags in a second here. Yeah, they actually, they're pretty hefty. So anywhere from about 80 to 100 pounds. And uh, depending on the season, it's somewhere between 25 to 35 bags, depending on the year. But they kind of determine that through Parks and Wildlife. Again, looking at the dredge back here, a lot of design going into that. They want to make sure they're not wasting their time getting uh, either undersized or oversized oysters there. Uh, you'll also notice this little basket down here. It's kind of a cool little basket. It doesn't have a bottom in it. And what they're gonna do is they'll fill that basket, put that burlap bag around the outside of it there, and then shake it down in there. Why do you think they use burlap bags? Why aren't they using plastic bags? Or yeah, it pokes right through, exactly. It doesn't work too good. I guess hefty bags probably would work, but it also provides a little bit of cooling for them there because then actually a lot of times on these warmer days, you'll see the guys out there that will actually spray those bags down with water. That'll cause a little bit of evaporation. It'll actually start to cool the oysters down a tad bit there. So those oyster bags work pretty good. Uh, unfortunately, we do find them all over our shorelines and stuff, but it is a pretty effective way to transport these oysters. Now, once these oysters come to shore, up oh, here's the guy I was telling you about. He's got loading them up there. So he's sitting there taking them. Uh, these boats have a modified little structure on the back of them here. It's called a stinger. And that's what they actually haul the bags off of the boat with there. And once they'll start doing that, they'll start stacking them onto a pallet. And that pallet, one of the first things that happens is you get a tag that goes on there. That tag tells you the boat that it came off of, an approximate date, and the captain of that boat. So they can come back and track that oyster. Once it's on the pallet there, they stack them up. Then another tag goes on there. They're putting the tags on there, showing you exactly who's taking ownership of it. I think I have a close-up of a tag here. It's an old one. But that tells you a little bit about what's all on the tag. It tells you an approximate date. It tells you the location of Ranzas Bay. It's got the number on there that they can come back and look at. This is real important to do because they want to keep track of these oysters. And these oysters, again, when they're going to market out there, if you're eating oysters in Texas here, ask your server to show you the tags. If you're eating raw oysters, you go to any of the restaurants around here, I eat them in the wintertime, no problem. I'd always ask the waiter to say, hey, can you show me the tags? And uh, they'll kind of look at you funny because nobody ever asked for it. But they are required by law to keep track of these tags. If you watch the guy in the back there that's usually shucking the oysters, he'll take those tags and stick them on there. Because all of a sudden, if somebody ends up getting sick or have some kind of issues, the health department can go back and they can look at that log and find out where those oysters came from. Once they get all the appropriate tags on them, then they can load them up and usually put them into a refrigerated truck. That's the only thing that goes on shucked oysters like that. So there's not a, lot of, uh, not a lot of things go on there, maybe a little bit of refrigeration. But if you're buying oysters, they come straight from the boat. The idea is to get them relatively fresh. You don't want them sitting out for very long. They do put them on a refrigerated truck. That seems to help with it a little bit there. Those are the oysters that are going to market. The other oysters that go into the fish house for your shucked oysters, they go by this guy here. He's actually a southpaw. He's doing them left-handed there. But you see he's got his knife there. It's got kind of a sharp end on it there. They'll take that break that umbo, slice that area out, all the oyster shell, the good oyster, the oyster meat, I should say, the animal itself goes into the stainless bucket. All the leftover shell goes into this bucket. Eventually when that bucket gets full, they throw it onto this conveyor belt and that conveyor belt takes it outside. 
the oysters themselves, the little animals, once they get transferred from that stainless steel bucket, they'll take them, they'll rinse them in all kinds of cool water there. They don't put any preservatives on them, any kind of chemicals on them, just cold water. They'll put them into these buckets and then put them on ice and they will sell them there. You can buy them by the pint, the quart, the half gallon, the gallon, and uh, that's the way a lot of our oysters are sold there. Our oysters, again, the ones that are shucked inside and all that shell gets put on that conveyor system and brought outside. And this is actually a relatively small pile. There's a couple piles around town. If you've driven through Rockport lately, there's one that's about probably 25, 30 feet high there. But all this oyster shell used to be kind of just given away and used for road material and all kinds of stuff now, but they found some good market for this as well. Right now, a lot of this oyster shell is being sold to Purina. Purina takes it, grinds it up, and adds it to their chicken feed. Why do you think they want to add it to chicken feed? What's that? Protein. Well, protein, this is most of the shell. There's probably some leftover protein in there, but what do you think's in that shell? Calcium, calcium exactly. And what are eggs made out of? Calcium. calcium, exactly. So it's a good calcium supplement. I have a buddy of mine who raises chickens. He actually bought like a $20 bag of oyster shell, and it was this little bitty here, and since then he's been using our local stuff here. But oyster shell is a big market for that stuff, so they end up, uh, Purina buys a lot of it. It's also used in women's cosmetics. Okay, y'all be using some of that for graduation this weekend. Uh, ladies' cosmetics also used in pharmaceutical industry there as well. So, uh, again, real important stuff there. So it's not just a waste material anymore. It's actually very, very important to use for that. So they found another market for it. All right. Moving on with our oysters. Again, I was talking about oysters, ecology, economy, history, all these things coming together here. Lots of historical significance with our, our oysters here. Of course, we've already talked about our Karankawa and the importance that they have there. Also used a food source, used a lot for transportation, navigation, and as a building material. The um, transportation, if you look at a lot of our roads here throughout the coastal bend, if you dig down far enough, chances are they have an oyster reef base to them down there. A lot of those oyster shells, like I was talking about, uh, now that are being sold to Purina, used to be a good source of rock for our ears. So they would go and buy this stuff up. They'd make our roads out of it there, pave it over. They're also on top of our oyster reefs. This is actually from Portland area. You can see the bridge over there, the old bridge. I have to say the new bridge is coming on here eventually. I have to change these slides out. But a lot of these roadways are actually built right on top of these old oyster reefs. You can almost walk all the way from Portland to Corpus there on top of an oyster reef right there between uh, Nueces Bay and Corpus Christi Bay, that opening there. So a uh, really good solid structure there to build roads on. Okay. Come on, there we go. The uh, navigation, if you look at any of the old navigation charts, this is an 18, uh, 1837 map uh, looking at Copano Bay and Mission Bay. More importantly, the big thing you're looking at here are those oyster reefs out there. So for navigation purposes, they could come in and if you had a deep draft ship, you had to make sure that you could get around those oyster reefs and you would also use those oyster reefs. This one here in particular, this is what is known as Copano Reef here. On the back side of this is the old town of El Copano, oldest seaport in Texas. And even today on the back side of that reef, we've still got six, seven, eight foot of water on the back side of that reef. Our prevailing winds are usually coming this direction, so it gives you a nice little natural harbor there, if you will. So uh, some really interesting stuff there associated with navigation and knowing about those reefs. If you don't know where those reefs are, it's going to cost you a lot of money because chances are you're going to run up on them and tear up your boat, right? You've done that before. There we go. All right, and as a building material, this is something that's kind of cool. We'll be doing another segment here later on on shellcrete. But a lot of our early settlers into our area here, they showed up to this area thinking, oh, man, this is going to be great. They've given us land here in Texas. going to be really cool. We're ready to start building, and they look at our trees, and you all live here in Ingleside, and what are our trees like here? They're big, right? But can you build much out of them? Are there many of those oak limbs that are very straight? It doesn't do you much good, so you can't build a lot out of wood. If you had to get wood, you had to get it through New Orleans. It cost you a lot of money. Well, being industrious as they are, they went back. They realized they knew their chemistry, right? Going back to Roman times, you can actually take calcium and heat it up to about 700 degrees, and you could actually uh, uh, form a crude cement out of it there. So you can take this oyster shell, grind it up, heat it up to about 700 degrees, make a cement, mix some sand and shell back into it, and you can form... This crude concrete, you can look here, it's got these little lines in it here. Those are what they do call a slip mold. And so what they do is they make this little mold area, they fill it full of this shellcrete, allow it to harden, and then they move that mold up again. And I've got several pictures of the shellcrete here. If you walk around over in downtown Corpus Christi, a lot of shellcrete there. Uh, Heritage Park over in Corpus has got some. We've got some over in Rockport. I'm, I'm sure there's some stuff here in Ingleside dealt with shellcrete. You know of any, Jeff? 
don't know of any there, but this is again all on the backside of Copano Bay. Some great examples of shellcrete there. And you can see there's some different mixtures there depending on what they were doing. If they were doing a foundation, they wanted it to be really strong, they'd add a lot of solid shell into there and that solid shell would actually kind of layer up on there. No rebar, like we use rebar today. This has got more shell in there and it kind of lays together and it gives that concrete some real strength there. This is 1830s vintage shellcrete here, by the way. There again, you can see that. That's actually part of an old cistern back there. So they actually made a, um, a big cistern back there to actually hold fresh water. So evidently it was solid enough that they could hold that water in there. All right. Um, also, more modern times, you don't see it much today, but we do use, uh, was used as a roofing material. Actually worked pretty good. It was white, somewhat reflective there. Uh, I don't think it fits with our hurricane codes that we have today, but uh, if you had a big wind, I guess the worst that happens, you go out and you pick up your roof and throw it back up on there again. But uh, don't see that too much. I know a lot of the older homes in the area here had it. We mentioned road material here before that it was really good road material. You put it down at first, it actually kind of has to compact. Once it gets compact in there, that's almost like digging through concrete. So very, very effective road material. Here you can see how it kind of gets compacted in there. And uh, a lot of that, if you have to dig this stuff out, first thing you got to do is get a pickaxe because you can't just shovel it out anymore once it all gets good and compacted like that. The, uh, this is kind of a cool deal here. I want to show this, and a lot of people, the picture was actually taken to show the boat there, but look at the barges that are back behind it there. This is actually in Oasis Bay there, and these are what they call their mud shell barges. If you've been over to Corpus and down on Water Street, almost everything from that big berm in Corpus Forward is actually built out of oyster shell from Nueces Bay. So as Corpus Christi was growing, one of the things they did is they didn't have any rocks down here. We didn't have a lot of stuff. You didn't have to transport it in. It was real easy to go out and harvest this mud shell, which is kind of the oyster reef itself and some of the mud and everything else that came with it. Put it onto these barges, take the barge to shore, and then you can drop that off into your different vehicles. And so a lot of that area of downtown Corpus is all built with, and there we go. Uh, here again, some of that road material here, you can see here building these roads, almost all of our older roads here, if you dig down far enough, you're gonna find that there's an oyster shell base in it because that's what they were all used all throughout the 20s and 30s there. Uh, this picture here is showing this little truck back here in the back. This is very important because they didn't use the big dump trucks. They would sink down in our sand. So they liked these smaller vehicles here and they would actually put the boards in the truck there and unbolt those. So when they filled the truck up with the oyster shell, they could pull those boards out one by one and that oyster shell would just fall down right on top of them and allow them to not get stuck in the sand there as they built that road. So a uh, little bit about going on there with our road building. All right. And one last thing, of course, our oyster oddities. We can't talk about oysters without bringing this. And this was a famous deal here from back in the 30s here. But we were actually in Ripley's, believe it or not, when somebody entered a duck eating oyster into their catalog there. So if you go back and research your Ripley, Ripley's, believe it or not, you'll find our entry from the coastal bend here of duck eating oysters. Obviously not what oysters are feeding on, but makes for a good story there. But uh, lastly, if you have any questions, be sure and ask, and uh, I'll be glad to talk with you about it. But oysters, again, uh, hopefully I've explained a little bit about some of our ecology, our history, our economy associated with oysters. They play a big part in our coastal bend here, and let's hope that they continue for the next 100 years or so again. So interesting stuff about oysters. Go out and eat you some oysters, guys. Thank you all.